Thank you, first of all, for the New York Theatre Workshop to show up here as one of the great institutions, legendary institutions in New York City, the closest that we have to the Royal Court in London. And, um, and anybody who uh, works in theatre um, knows how hard it is to run a theatre. But you also find out about um, <laughs> uh, and to run it for five years or seven years or ten or twenty. But uh, Linda and uh, Jim both worked for thirty years, um, and at the ship, at the deck, uh, at the steering wheel um, of this great institution, and um, and created a body of work like an artist as paintings, um, like in poet writes poems. They created as artists uh, this New York theater workshop we all know and like about it. It created a style. Of course, once you have a style, it's uh, recognizable. It's not other people who do other styles, but they have a strong handwriting, I think, and it is something that is of significance for what they created. And tonight is not a PR talk. Um, it's not, you know, it's thank you, you know, for what it is trying. We're trying to have a real honest talk. What does it mean to produce theater? Um, how was theater in New York City when they started? How was it when they left? What is going on now? Um, what did they learn, especially? What are the experiences? And uh, we have many of our audience actually live and how around here. So we just want to say hello to everybody. And somewhere is listening. Now a young kid, he, she, they, who will run theater when they say, I remember that talk with Jim and Linda, and also with um, Jean and uh, Patricia. Um, who were here tonight. So this is something of importance to really look back and to be in the moment but also look in the future that your theater is all about actually the work of it. And so we are also practicing it. So the dialogue as what we do here at the scene is on the bridge between academia and professional theater, international and American theater. And I think it's a it's a great topic. I also would like to thank the audience for coming. We need great theater. We also need great audiences is ultimately for them. So that means a lot that you took time out. I know how much is out there. So it's very important for us, also the viewers at their screens. Also, welcome Melanie Joseph, who did great work here uh, in, in New York City with her Foundry Theater and many others who are here with us, Aaron and others. So um, really, thank you all for coming. Um, we might start just what everybody knows. Of course, everybody should know who you guys are. Uh, the Yonbi was probably going to have some undergrads uh, from uh, around the nation and also international viewers. So uh, maybe we go around and you introduce a little bit who you are <clears throat> and um, what you did. So we get a little bit of an idea before we start. But everybody has <coughs> the same form, and I do too. And it should be off. Take your time. <laughs> yeah, off all the way. Also, to the yeah. it doesn't. But it never rings at our events actually ever. But still, it doesn't, so um, it's important uh, to have a time where we listen, or where we do kind of radical listening at least, because I seem to be talking more all the time. <laughs> so, um, Linda, tell us a little bit about, about you. how did you get to the theater, and who are you, what do you do? Uh, I'm Linda Chapman. I came to New York in 1973 mm -hmm. as an actor at the time. And uh, after a number of adventures, which I won't go into right now, I did meet Jim. In, I was pursuing directing. It was his first season as artistic director of the workshop, 88, 89 season. And uh, my friend Lola and I subsequently worked on our play, Gertrude and Alice, through the workshop. And Jim, in 1995, asked me to become his associate artistic director at that time. So I sort of let the directing go. I'd already given up on the acting a while back, where I had decided that what an actor has to do was not what I wanted to do. 
And at any rate, we we hooked up ninety-five. Jim's already kind of underway. We had we had created the usual suspects community by 1995, which we can talk about a little bit more if you'd like to, but that is our extended artistic community, and we've got members of that artistic community here tonight still. Um, and uh, yes, and together we developed an awful lot of work. I, I worked a lot on the development of, of, uh, of new projects. That was a big focus for me going through, so we had summer residencies our Monday three readings, um, other kinds of developmental opportunities. So that's a little bit of the palette, and we can go into any of that. And you were born, where were you? I was born in Spokane, Washington, where my family still lives. But came to New York on a Greyhound bus. $500 in my pocket. <laughs> Me. Um, I just want to say that Spokane, Washington, the state of Washington has outlawed all assault weapons. Oh. And, <laughs> so me, um, I grew up in Hartford, outside of Hartford, Connecticut. Um, I came to New York in 1972, right out of college. Um, probably thinking I was pursuing Directing, um, I, got, I sort of got sidetracked into casting, <clears throat> and I spent um, a year and a half at the organizational theater communications group as a receptionist, and then I went to then was the New York Shakespeare Festival in the casting office for five years from 1975 to 1980, and I arrived with chorus line and left with. Uh, Pirates and Pendants, basically. Um, and then I went to Arena Stage in DC from 80 to 88, and then to the workshop in 88. Um, also, I look at sort of in the more familial perspective, I went from my father, Joe, to my mother, Zelda, um, with my great aunt, Rosemary Tischler, um, also in that mix all the way through. Um, yeah. My name is Patricia McGregor. I'm the current artistic director at New York Theatre Workshop. Uh, I'm from St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands, and I grew up in carnival, parade, performing. Um, my mom was an art teacher, and she sewed the sequins on all the carnival. So everything was always simple transformations. Um, it took me a while to realize that I'm always trying to make a bespoke thing in, in four walls, and then I'm always trying to burst it out into the streets. I think that has to do with um, that experience in Carnival. We moved a lot growing up. Um, I moved to New York in 2000 and uh, had some survival jobs, went to the O'Neill. August Wilson was there and, and I was thinking about going to a corporate life and he said, your mom doesn't need you to buy her house. She needs you to sew the dreams that she put in you. And so uh, I, my first professional job in theater was stage managing the Medea with Fiona Shaw and Deborah Warner. I often say that was my first um, grad school. Um, I ended up going to grad school for directing after having spent some time acting and writing. I met Jim and Linda before graduate school. I actually think it was Liz Diamond who first introduced me to a reading, a Mondays at Three reading. I remember sitting outside of the workshop and thinking, one day I'll, I'll get an invitation to go in, and Liz invited me in. At that time, Melanie, you know, I was doing a lot of assisting, associate um, directing work, went to graduate school, came back, um, did directing for about 10 years. Um, some in New York, moved to California, moved to Hawaii, and um, was always invited back in different ways to do workshops. There was a, a James Baldwin piece that was, you know, that we were thinking, hoping to track into production, and um, and then got the call to to answer this mighty call. And so, um, big big shoes all around on on my right and left, and trying to step into them um, with bravery and truth. Uh, I'm Jean Passanante. I'm um, from St. Louis, Missouri, where you can buy a handgun um, <laughs> uh, anywhere you want without a permit and without a background check, and you can carry it loaded anywhere you want. And now they're trying to defund the libraries. Just putting that out there. So I live in New York, <laughs> and um, I've been here since 76, since after college. And um, 
I did a lot of, I worked at various theaters and I guess I too started wanting to act, wanting to direct, um, did a tiny bit of it and realized it wasn't enough somehow to sustain me in all the ways in which one needs to be sustained. And um, so I did, I worked at Williamstown and uh, Lincoln Center and a bunch of other places and then and then the O'Neill, um, where it was Lloyd Richards, associate director, and did the casting. And I got to cast Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, August Wilson, his first play there. And um, that was all pretty great. And then I met um, Allison Clark. Well, I already knew Allison Clarkson and Stephen Graham. And they told me that they had a uh, group, but they were trying to start it. Well, well, they had an organization called, it was originally called the Stephen Graham Foundation, and um, they decided they they needed to go for a nonprofit status, and that it would be very difficult to raise money for an organization called the Stephen Graham Foundation. <laughs> so they changed the name to New York Theater Workshop. And they asked me uh, because I had been working with playwrights at the O'Neill and elsewhere uh, to be what they called the project director. And you can get more into this, but that's that was how I got into it. I got to New York Theater Workshop and then um, did that for four years, I think, and then <clears throat> went to New Dramatists after that, and then have done a lot of really crazy stuff in television, notably um, writing soap operas for 26 years, which surprised me more than anything in my life. That <laughs> um, I actually loved it and had a great time and learned an enormous amount from it. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you all. So <clears throat> let's maybe start with Linda and Jen. What is the New York Theatre Workshop all about? What was your idea of what is New York Theatre? Well, I met Jim when I was still working with the Worcester Group. I was with the Worcesters for about 11 years, and I was a manager, but I also performed with them and was attempting to create new work uh, as a director. Met I met Melanie Joseph at about the same time I met Jim. We were part of the women's project. So I think under, I think an underlying value for me has always been ensemble and how do you create ensemble in the commercial theater of New York. My training, what my teachers had trained with, uh, with uh, Erwin Piscotter, great German political uh, theater director at the New School back in the late 40s. Who were your teachers? Uh, they, their names were Robert and Joan Welch. They moved to Spokane. I think they were trying to escape the, the uh, communist, uh, the, 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 the red listing of, of the period, honestly. I think that is, they never said that, but I think that was the case. Um, and they, uh, they were contemporary with Judith Molina. So they were, they were in, this, in, in that same, Harry Belafonte, who just passed away, was a classmate of his. I mean, the whole generation of, of people, B. Arthur, exactly, B. Arthur, the golden girl. Yeah, <laughs> of course, how could I forget? Um, an amazing, an amazing group of actors, but, but, you know, Melina kind of shows us the way, you know, in terms of, uh, what was the quote? You, you said that uh, when we had a little meeting, Frank, uh, this daughter taught us about breaking the fourth wall and the living broke the fourth wall. <laughs> I had that in my sort of my, my educational DNA coming to New York. So anyway, we had worked with Melanie, we had a, a, a director's group. It's this idea of how do we work together? How do we collaborate? How do we break down the, the system? And I think Jim and I had a resonance. We were both born in 1950, we kind of come out of that same moment uh, political, you know, wanting to get away from the middle class America that our parents worked so hard to build. Um, and and I think we found in each other kind of coming from, I came from the downtown theater, worked with uh, Crystal Field and George Martini at the Theater for the New City, Sonia Moore, the, the Russian who was trying to teach the most updated version of, of uh, uh, the Stanislavski system. Uh, Jim and I resonated with each other, kind of me from the downtown. He had his downtown experience and also had the regional theater experience. So what how do how do we make work? How do we how do how do you have ongoing kind of an ongoing uh, philosophy and conversation? I think the conversation is actually where we really 
started. Our, we both love theater history. Um, how do you make an ensemble out of freelance theater workers? And I think that's where the usual suspects came from. Growing out of Jean's new director's project, right. which was there. I think Jim was taking the material that was handed on to him. And, you know, Stephen Graham was always interested in supporting individual artists who were not going to necessarily be commercially viable. So Jim was very conscious of what, you know, what that beginning was. Eric Condoli and Peter Sellers were two of the first artists that Stephen Graham supported, um, some of the first productions that the, even before it was a workshop that, you know, the, the, the Graham Foundation was supporting. So I think that for me is that that idea of ensemble and an ongoing company and an ongoing conversation. How do we develop ideas that we all share and can continue to build on, you know, in the environment that the commercial environment basically that we find ourselves in. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I, I just want to say before I jump in here, <clears throat> this is uh, a historic occasion to have this lineup of history in place, which I've been trying to do for a long time, and it's been impossible to get all of these people in the same room, and Frank did it. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, you know, I have my mythology the legends that were passed down that perhaps, as we know about myth and legend, it gets embroidered in the telling and the passing along. So Jean is here to uh, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, I, I just remember, uh, I'm trying to answer your question by going back through time. Um, when I was at the arena stage in D.C., um, I got a call to see if I wanted to apply for this job. Um, and I had noticed the work of the workshop um, already and had somewhere not consciously thought in my mind, this is a theater I would be interested in somehow being involved with. And I didn't say that about many because there was a lot that wasn't that interesting. Um, what I really responded to um, partly because I was a young director trying to make my way in a pretty um, uninterested, disinterested, let's say, um, world. Um, this, as far as I could tell, and to this day, I believe this is still true, was the only organized effort in support of the director and in the craft of directing, the art of directing, the only place that in 1979, when it started as the foundation, um, <clears throat> in the American theater was, and I mean, really, honestly, still is about the playwright. The play, the writing is the center, or the apex, maybe center is the wrong word. Um, and the director, and I've heard even directors, surprisingly how many directors have said, they are the servant of the playwright, which always astounds me. Um, but the director was never acknowledged as, a, as an artist, it was a facilitator. And what I loved about the workshop <clears throat> with Stephen and Jean was that they said the director is equal. And they formed an organization that supported both of those intentions. And that was very powerful to me. And something I wanted to put my life energy in service of. Um, the other thing that I loved about it is that, um, and, and again, Jean, you have to really uh, correct me if I have this wrong. I'll be happy to. Having inhabited institutions, the New York Shakespeare Festival and the Arena Stage, and an organization like Theater Communications Group, which is a service organization for the field of not-for-profit institutions. I loved that there was a, 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 almost an allergy to institutionalizing of, of real estate and a subscri you know, subscription season, all of that. It was really about, we're going to start with the artists that we're believing in, 
and we're going to make form and structure follow what <laughs> they need and want. And it would be as much as if you need your rent paid, we'll do that. I need a new tech writer. I need a few actors to sit around my kitchen table, read me these few scenes, all the way up to uh, supporting and producing workshops. And one of the first things was that I recall, and you can probably fill in better on this, was Harry Condolian being one of the first writers. His play, Christmas on Mars, which was one of the first that I remember of his impact, had a big, healthy grant from the Stephen Graham Foundation to support it. And I thought that was really a remarkable way to center the artist. Um, and so I really wanted to follow that. And what I loved about what happened when it went from the foundation to becoming a theater through Jean's um, guidance and wisdom, I'm sure, um, <clears throat> it, took, it tried to preserve and reinvent those basic ideas. That it was about the artist, the artist drove the thing, Structure followed that as much as possible. Um, and the other thing that I loved about it is that it was about and understood that structure, that idea, centered what theater making really is, which is relationships. You can't make theater without someone else. And, and you, have to, you have to figure out when to balance. You have to find when to find the balance between this is my egotistical or my personal impulse and this person's personal impulses. So when do I surrender to that? When do I yield to that? When do I, when do we together synthesize into something different? That's the real core of it. Um, it's not about um, a sort of dictatorial um, something at the top, it's like certain things tend to go. <laughs> um, but I think that was it. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I loved about this place was in the title of it, New York Theater Workshop. So uh, as I, when I first arrived, I thought that the, the, the discussion was with the board about how do we raise our profile, how do we have impact, how do we, um, how do we, you know, more people know about what we do and care about it. Um, and not just from the perspective of write a check. You know, what does this mean? What does this do in the field? Um, and I, so what I liked was that this is a theater that can only happen in this city that is called New York. So it's right there in the, in the defining um, of the organization, a theater. Um, and as we always talk about, it's, the, it's that part of our work that where the needs and wants and care of the audience is most important, or is the first priority that's to have it. And then the workshop is where the artists and their process and their needs are first priority. And those can shift and change, but basically those are the two things. So that it, it, in my way of thinking how I could do my job, what was going on in the theater was a conversation with our community. It was where we put forward to our community, the voices of our secular um, shamans, our sacred beings speaking to us and helping us understand the experience we were having. And it wasn't just one voice, it was uh, multiple voices over a period of time. Um, and the, on the workshop side, which could involve the audience, if, if you know there was a need for a process to be hearing from the audience. Um, I remember learning that as, over and over again at a first performance, a first preview of what you would learn by hearing when they laughed, when they coughed, when they were sort of shifting around, how much you learned about what was heard and what was what landed and what didn't. Um, so that could be a vital part of the process. Um, so the, the thing of New York Theater Workshop, the multiple equally important things um, and in the land of budget and fundraising and so forth. Um, at the time, this was all sort of formulating. Um, for sure, there were organizations like the O'Neill, like New Dramatists, that were solely about process. Um, 
And in the funding world, in the, the, the check writing world, they were important, but you know, this theater thing is really much more important. Um, and what we were trying to do is to say, this is all equally important. We do not emphasize this over that. The needs, perhaps a, a resource on this side might be greater than that, but we, we only dispense resource um, with equal commitment to that. Uh, probably more human resource went into the development of the Correct. Of the yes. World. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, the, this would allude to the creation of this community of artists seemed really important to me because I, I have, a, a again, what I remember of my first moments at the workshop is Jean had a, a sort of a, a bunch of plays under consideration for future, and I had to jump in and pick two plays to fill out a season. <clears throat> I remember thinking, I don't really, I've never played the role of artistic leader before, but I'm sure this is not the way I want to do it. This is like suddenly have to pick two plays from this, <laughs> that what's here, because that's expedient. Um, and I really wanted, ultimately it felt like the, the, the goal would be that I would be listening to artists and assembling a conversation from the, the um, bunch of artists that it would really be the artists that were leading and that I was just facilitating that, that sort of conversation. I think I'll shut up <laughs> What was the hardest to do? What did you learn? Well, out of this community of artists, I mean, I think we had almost when I started in 95, I think we already had about 100 people who had been new directors in the past. We kind of tried to, you know, try to uh, herd all of the community members who had preceded us. There was a playwrights group, uh, kind of an ad hoc playwrights group, and we invited those people in. There were actors who'd been in the shows. So I think what's hard is out of 100 people who have 100 or more projects, and you have limited resource in a season, how do you pick three or four projects out of these hundred? I mean, we've created a problem for ourselves <laughs> right off the bat. Well, also, I think one of the, just a sort of sidebar to this, one of the things that was really important to me was um, <clears throat> in the field, um, and I don't think much has changed in this, in this respect, um, there's a lot of focus on supporting emerging artists, and I always wondered, well, where's the point at which an artist stops emerging and they stop <laughs> needing support? That never happens, and there's no room for that. And why are we segregating artists? So our community was hopefully pulling together, uh, you know, an artist with years of experience with someone new, and hopefully they would be benefiting each other. So what else was hard to? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, so yeah, well, that is the thing that comes to mind is certainly the endless, endless um, pursuit of resource to do what I believed in and what I was surrounded by people who I loved and believed in and wanted to make them happy. And um, that was relentless. Well, we, we also, I think this, we both had this kind of value of not wanting to say no to artists. Yeah. You create a community, you got people who want to, who want to be part of what you're trying to create. So we kind of made a rule that we didn't say no. You might not be able to do what a person wanted or an artist wanted to do. But could you give them something else? Could you always offer something? So I think that also was a challenge that we, that we, you know, and you never satisfy everybody or anybody usually. <laughs> <laughs> there, uh, yeah. I think that's that is the. Well, how many suspects are there today? Over five hundred. Yeah, because uh, close we, to six hundred. We never successfully figured out a way to say you're out. Because that seemed like the opposite. Of Only when we lose people's contact information. <laughs> it would mean you could do five productions a year, hundred years. Yes, exactly. To do everyone. Um, tell us what are some of the productions that crystallized for you? What you did here? Say this went, this went right. This actually showed what we dreamt about. 
Well, I think we have, Jim and I really have a lot of differences of opinion, believe it or not. I mean, even though we did work pretty well together for a long time. For me, what I, when I look back at the workshop, and there maybe weren't the biggest successes, but to me, the work we did supporting ensembles, again, back to the ensemble, for me, this is always that, how do you make a company? You know, and how do we have companies within the companies. I mean, so city companies sort of got its, got its uh, start with Anne Bogart using space at NYTW. When I first started, even before I started, she was there. Uh, uh, the five lesbian brothers who we met down the street uh, at the Wild Cafe became, you know, part of the, the, the ongoing uh, ongoing groups to elevator repair service. And then numerous, numerous really other companies, the Improbable Theater. Bela McDermott, now was a big opera director, but, you know, we met them through PS122 originally and uh, his company. Ben. Ruben. Ruben Galendo and, and yeah, who was just the, the director of Victor's piece. So there are numerous companies. So for me, that, it, and I think that there is still something to be done there in terms of how do we give resource to independent theater? Because I'm, I'm a little aghast, frankly, that the workshop has turned into the institution it has. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's never my goal, personally. So to see how a, an institution can support in individuals or independent theater, to me, more than any one production, to me, that's been a big, that's, that's to me, a, a, you know, one of the big successes, frankly. And uh, we started our, our we, that kind of got, that got uh, closed down through the, uh, through, through the pandemic, but we started a project in the 4th Street Theater, our small theater called Next Door at NYTW, where we were supporting independent productions, never to the level I wished we could have. But again, I think there's something in that as we look at how do we, how do we reclaim the theater now post-pandemic, uh, I, I think so-called institutions, you know, an institution is really most concerned with its own survival, or as much as we espouse wanting to support individual artists, the institution is needs to survive first and foremost. So, okay, given that that's how we have set this up, you know, with our corporate, our corporate not-for-profit theaters, um, how do we how do we keep the the independent theater movement alive? Because that's no matter what you're seeing on Broadway, those. If all the seeds came from the, the independent work, I really do believe that. I, I think, um, listening to your question, Frank, um, uh, personally, I, I would say probably the whole drama about Rachel Corey, the production of my, my, uh, my name is Rachel Corey, yeah. was the most, uh, the darkest. Moments. I, I mean, there were also moments of. Um, there's a moment about 20 years ago where I, I didn't think we were gonna. Not just me, but all of us didn't think we were gonna make it. Um, and that was a. Yeah, but there was a generosity of board members who stepped up and got us through it. <clears throat> well, 2008, the big, yeah. the big crash. Yeah. Yeah. But who's what? What did you? What did you? What were you the happiest about? What What did you take the most pride in in terms of things? Uh, 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 what you were, uh, yeah, or what came to fruition? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Not to pick one of your children. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think of it in that way. Um, I think it was that that. Uh, well, I don't know. People, others would have to tell me this, but I, I think that the notion that we could not be pinned down, um, that there wasn't necessarily a, um, we, we couldn't be branded for a long time. Right. right. Jeremy managed somehow. Yeah. The when we were doing some marketing <laughs> research, we did some surveying of. Um, People who were attendees of productions and the things that made me happiest were the consistency. The thing that that was the most prevalent was just worth put it um, 
more poetically than this. The, what they loved was that they never knew what was going to happen to them or what they would find when they walked through the double doors into the space. Um, that was somewhat about the reconfiguring of the space over and over again, um, which I really loved. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think maybe the most successful of that, well, I'm not going to say that. The most um, potent of those was the scenes from marriage that we go to. Um, so that the space itself becomes uh, a character or a piece of the theatrical experience. Or Hades Town. Hades Town. Pretty is great, you know, that was it. Um, but I think I think I liked I think I felt the best about that fact. Um, and that probably just in a personal level. Um, as a kid growing up as a little gay boy in the 50s and 60s and not really clear that there was a place for me ever in this life. Um, and I found life and possibility sitting in a theater seat. And as my you know, long gone friend Carlin Wright said, <clears throat> everything I've ever learned about life and history I learned in a theater seat. Um, and I think that has been my personal lifelong goal is whatever I experience positively, I want to share it. And I think that is, that is probably the most clear I can be about the psychological gesture of artistic leadership for me was the sense of sharing what excited me. Um, you know, sitting in the room and we did a reading of um, slave play, um, and we had been as a as an organization through several um, training sessions and really focusing in on um, white supremacy, racism, uh, all of those important things. And I sat in the reading. I didn't know what I was getting into because I had read the play before. I walked into the room, sat through the reading and had the most transforming experience emotionally from that play. And I thought, well, I think maybe I've learned as much from sitting for these two or three hours in the presence of this writer and these artists as I have all the training and so forth, which was maybe that fed why I could have that experience. But it was what, it, nothing was clearer to me in that moment than, well, I think we should do this. We should share this. Recognizing that some people might not find it exciting, but I found it powerful. And giving a space for one of my readings that something yes. like this happens. And Martha Graham famously said, you know, I don't look for movements and I also let movements come to me. Mm -hmm. But you have to create it. I create the space we have. Yeah. It's very hard work. And I would like to thank you both. And really, in the name of New York City Theater, International Theater, um, but what you did is a life's work. Um, Patricia, you said uh, you came around 2000, I remember right. What did New York Theatre Workshop mean for you? I remember the first production I saw, which I can't remember if I'd seen a reading before production or not, but I saw uh, Light Raise the Roof, Kia Corthran's Light Raise the Roof that Michael Garces um, directed. And it was about a lot of things, but um, centered in it was communities of people who are living in abandoned subways, and, and uh, Chris McKinney was in it. And I remember several things. I remember, you know, in terms of the mise en scene, I remember what I think of still as an, an essentialized version that was both the exposed brick of the space that we were actually in, but a design that felt um, magical, transformative, essentialized. Beautiful. I remember the design walking in right away. And then I walked out and I walked to the subway and I got on the subway and I drove past a, a, or rode past a place that seemed abandoned, but I am sure I had uh, rode past hundreds of times. And I was awakened in a new way to what might be happening in that corner that I could, in my comfort, just drive by. And I still think about it. I'm, I'm changed by that moment, by, by what it forced me to, and invited me to look at. People I was invited to care about in a deeper way that I thought I cared about intellectually, but 
had me sit with them in a way that was beautiful and challenging and and um, so I I still hold it with me. So the workshop was a place that to me, and it was it was aesthetically pleasing. It was, you know, it was virtuosic in so many ways. There was poetry to it. There was, and yet it provoked me in an artful way to try and be a better citizen. That's what that's what the workshop was for me. There was this not a lecture, but a, a virtuosic, artistic um, experiment that shook me up to a moment and woke me up to a calling for better citizenry. And that is what um, it meant to me. That's what it still means to me. And that's what I hope it can continue to mean to generations of people. Um, maybe before we come, also, what, what, what you kind of dream of, think of a, a dream for you, who was in the very beginning. Maybe give us also your interpretation of it. What was the very beginning, the acorn, you know, the, what was the idea, and how did you look at those 30 years? Uh, you, I'm sure you follow it. I, what do you yes, think about Very closely. And um, I, well, I, I think in the beginning, I, I had a sort of practical idea that, I, well, it was both practical and my personal inclination was to work with the artists, as Jim was talking about, and to, to kind of cultivate directors, because they seem to provide the theatrical and divine spark to material that otherwise on the page. And, and not to denigrate a playwright, because certainly the, that page comes from the playwright. <laughs> but um, I think, you know, my own, I, I did, I, it was a pretty thriving time, I think, for the off-Broadway theaters. In New York, when I started, and there there was Playwrights Horizons in the public, but all the theaters that still exist. But it was prime time, I think, for all of them. And I felt, well, I don't know how we compete as a very new new group of people who started really without a a central artistic idea or a, a mission, um, but mostly just well, let's find some good plays to produce. I think. I mean, I don't want to denigrate it because it was a wonderful thing. And then, generosity and openness of Stephen Graham to make this happen is remarkable. Um, but, you know, I, I felt we, we needed to, the practical part was I, I thought we need to get our own people, you know, we need to cultivate our own people. And I, I do remember, you know, working with Michael Greif, who was a, one of the first, I think, maybe the second year of the New Directors Project. And just watching that mind at work, these theatrical ideas, you know, it was a, it was a very funny kind of quirky play called 70 Scenes of Halloween. And it was, we had such serious limitations in terms of budget and time and everything else, but somehow it was out there. That play it was completely realized. And David S. Bjornsson doing The Farmyard by Kruitz, uh, you know, that also, with nothing was completely realized and and I just said, okay, here we are. <laughs> this is kind of what needs to happen now. But you know, these things take time and I and I think there was a very long, very large, to be honest, learning curve for me and for the board to kind of get used to the idea that we really need to grow our own crops here, you know, and and um, and I Again, to be honest, felt I, I think I neglected. This sounds terrible, but I, you know, I neglected the audience part of, of the equation because I was so interested in the development of the artist part. And um, sometimes it worked what they did, and sometimes it didn't. And that was obvious. And and to me, it was kind of okay because I really saw, all right, we're getting somewhere here. Um, but then I, then I have to say, you know, I, for the 30 years that I've watched these guys do what they did, it's just been extraordinary because, um, you know, I, I, their, their, their producing genius is, is really a, a match, I think, that they've managed to do both these things to cultivate this group of, of writers that, that is a very large group of writers, but, and, Artists, I should say, not artists, writers, but and to make such magical work that 
and it, and it was, I mean, it's fun for me because I look at it and say, yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking of, but I didn't, you know, for various reasons, didn't have the wherewithal to make that happen. So it's been a, a marvelous experience <clears throat> to see the, that heightened uh, level of production, the theatricality, the using theater for what only theater can do, um, take ideas and make them tangible and, you know, and in the ozone at the same time. And uh, so I've been very grateful that, I, that I've been able to continue this relationship because it meant everything to me. So it's been a great thing. Well, you, just to pick up on something you said, you mentioned Kreutz. Yes. Um, that was one of the things that caught my mind and my eye way back when, long before I was affiliated in any way. Um, this was a theater in New York that was interested in writers who were not American. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was the international impulse was there from the start that the world of theater making is bigger than just our self-enclosed conversation. Um, and that, that was exciting to me and something that we tried to keep alive as much as we could going on. Um, but a lot of things always come back to, in my, as I was doing it, and I think you can say that we always refer back to fundamental conceptual values put in place by Stephen and Jean. Well, yes, and I think some of those directors that you cultivated, Jean, yeah. we yeah. continued. I mean, yeah. that, that was the, like the first wave of the usual suspect community. Yeah. And uh, Liz Diamond, yes, for running the director's program. Oh, weren't you in Liz Diamond's play that she did for the new director's project? I think it was the first play we did for the new director's project. I don't remember what it was, but I remember yeah, that. The last play I was in at the New York Theater Workshop was Quills. Oh, 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 oh yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Right. Five years. Yeah. Five years. Yeah. A play that needs to come back. Well, I, yes, I think so. I think so. Yeah. 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 And, uh, did many readings, yeah. but uh, I was not uh, a story. <laughs> <one question>. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't get you in. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe so yes. one time. Yeah, it's not really. It's just two makers killed me. It's not easy. It's they go not easy. easy. <laughs> getting into the New York Theater We all know that. Uh, tell us a bit about the space. How, mm -hmm. Did you rent it, the East Coast 3? Was it really going to start there? Oh, yeah, was it somewhere well, else? Well, our first theater was the Cubiculo. Mm -hmm. Remember the Cubiculo Theater? Mm -hmm. West 40 something Street. Uh, West mm -hmm. was, uh, was kind of a. Yeah. Yes. And I think I had some romantic idea about it because I had heard about plays by. I don't know, Megan Terry. I was just thinking about Megan Terry. People mm -hmm. had that had been done there. And um, so we rented that and we did, yeah, our very first play, which was from a playwright I met at the O'Neill, Robert Litz. And um, and then I think the Capicula for one more play. And then we found the Perry Street Theater, which I loved, but and it was very yes. narrow. It had, you know, not much of the, the brownstone, basically. And I think we, that was the theater from when I, we, I was never, I think by the time I left, we stopped using the Paris Street, right? Yeah. Did you guys use it? Oh, you did. I remember seeing Mutt, Mutt, not Mutt. Yeah, we were there. We yeah. got kicked out because the building was still. Oh, that's right. Yes. We could probably still be there. Yeah. It was, well, we were kind of outgrowing it though. Yeah, right. It was this, what, 99 seat house? Yeah, yeah. right. It was 99 seat house. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And we weren't really filling it. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the space on East 4th Street was purchased in 1992. I was involved as a suspect and as a curator, but yeah. And, and then summer of 95, we moved into the, uh, the office, what we call our office space next door, the Brownstone Road store. So yeah, we were still on, the offices were on 42nd, 42nd Street. Street. Right. Yes. Right. The camera burning. Yes. Yep. So did that move change your work? The building, the theater? <sighs> I think so. I think it, um, when we moved into to 79 East 4th Street, <clears throat> we were coming from a 99 seat theater. 
And we were very concerned about, because it had 299 seats, a tiny little stage that was really high and the roof was really low. Um, and we just knew going for, we couldn't, as Gene said, we couldn't fill 99 seats. How are we gonna, what are we gonna do with 299? So we reduced it, made the stage bigger, reduced the capacity to 150, which we thought, well, 50 more seats is probably something we can deal with. And then there was room to add 49 more if we were to come to that. Um, and then once we started to get some serious royalties from rent, we raised the roof of about six feet. And that, that I think was weirdly made the space work. You know, we, we did that, the, it was before rent. We did that the season, that summer when we moved in, I remember the blue awnings at the same yeah. time. Yeah, we did that work, yeah. Well, again, Stephen Graham made that uh, the purchase of the space yeah. possible. Yeah. It was being inhabited by a group called the Fourth Wall, a kind of psycho-social political oh, cult. God, yes. <laughs> but, but the real origins, the real origins of that space were the truck and warehouse. Yeah. From yeah. back Bruce Mailman and uh, uh, who's Bruce's partner? But they own they had they own Phoebe's. Uh, are you talking about Albert yeah. Cohen? Yeah, Albert Cohen and yeah. Bruce Millman. They they were they purchased they purchased the yeah. they created the truck and warehouse originally, and it was a it was a commercial off Broadway space. Just in the interest of history and my own egotism, <laughs> uh, the Nicholas Theatrical Company yes rented the truck and warehouse theater for a season or two. We played there. Uh, and we had many of the, the, the major works uh, premiere at that theater. Uh, and uh, we, I think before we inhabited it, uh, Tom Iam did uh, Women, women behind, behind Bars. Women Behind yeah. Bars yeah. was uh, mm -hmm. divine. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a big connection yes, to ridiculous. Yes, exactly. And Portland. John Ware's House of Blues. House of Blues premiered there. Steve Bath premiered there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Irene Thorne's uh, New York Theater Strategy mm -hmm. rented it for a couple of seasons. Then the ridiculous premiered there. Yeah. 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 Yeah was one of the very earliest of the off-off Broadway spaces. And uh, it was, um, yeah, it was back from the 50s. So both of these spaces have, you know, we, it's, I think that's just for us, we really love that we are part yeah. of this thing. And then the Lower East Side and the Yiddish Theater, you know, so yeah. we, we connect, I think, both of us. That's very probably nice. where our connection yeah. really, yeah. Yeah. really comes from. Coming back to Patricia, um, this were decades, some might say, of the Golden Theater in New York City, of the Golden Theater of uh, American Theater in the decades. Um, now people who say everything has changed. The time of Corona was a radical change, much deeper than somebody thought. I just want to talk to me that I, I mailed Mark Russell, or can he help me to put something up? And Mark said, you know, downtown theater is dead. I don't know what to say, but you put it up. What do you think of the time now? Uh, how to react to that with the history, the history, the history before the history. What's on your mind? How are you, how are you going to wrap your arms around it? I spent most of my life. I spent most of my life um, as an underdog, and when I went to graduate school, I felt like I was indoctrinated to a level of privilege that was unusual for me. And I feel I've worked very hard, but I've been very lucky um, to work in a lot of places and have a lot of support and speak a lot of truth in those places, but it's been very kind of magical. And I think my hope for myself and for the workshop and for the field is that I am leaders tasked with um, the moment 
can be alchemists and can be on the ropes, because I think the field is on the ropes right now, and can take that moment and through will, through coalition building, through um, holding on to what was magic in the past and visioning, can be alchemists. I think my task right now, you know, when Jim and I met, he said, you've got to find a way to make your artistic director work be an artistic practice, be a curation. And I think for a place that is known for the yes, and in a time that is known for no, it's first and foremost my job to find ways to find ways to that yes, find ways large and small to find the gold again. And some of that is going to be through approaching the work in a more communal way to say, you know, I often say we meet with cohorts of artistic directors and I say we can't be like sports teams. We've got to, you know, know our part in the field and know I think part of what the workshop here is to do is to do some of the more risky, radical work. Some of the work that's going to experiment with form, some of the work that's going to be very director driven in a different kind of way, artist driven in a different kind of way. That's our lane. But we can hold hands with other other theaters in ways that we we've tended to be a little more like sports teams that say it's not you know i'm only wearing this jersey and so i think out of necessity we're going to need to do some more coalition building and i think that could be good moving forward and luckily having had a freelance career for a long period of time you know i have a lot of friends in a lot of these places and we all want to hold each other up i've gotten kind of radical about some of my fund we're in a different financial structure than the workshop was born out of and that the times um, are, are calling upon us to have. And so whether it's big meetings at foundations, there's a piece that, you know, there's a big contraction, the bonus for contraction, and as a leader tasked with visioning the next um, wave, I've got to both uh, respond when people say we're at capacity and take care of people, and also find ways to push past that. And some of that means um, when there was a piece that I, you know, heard a reading of, and five minutes in, I said, we've got to do the show. It's larger than anyone's going to approve for me to do the show. And I went in, I had a meeting coming up with the Ford Foundation, and I called some friends and I said, Call, I've never met him, call Darren Walker, put in a good word, I'm going to make a big ask. And luckily, I went in and I was very clear that if I did not get a, a significant yes from this foundation, I was going to have to say a devastating no. And so I, I, um, Luckily, 20 years of relationships, because it is all about relationships, paid off. And I walked into the room and he said, oh, so-and-so just called. She sends her love. And I said, I'm going to make the big ask. <laughs> and I made the big ask. And hopefully that big ask will allow for a show to open our season that will be a, a signature that will feel like um, a reporter once quoted me saying my, my taking over of leadership would be an umbering. And I actually said an ombre, <laughs> very different. And to me, there is so I wouldn't have said yes to leadership in a lot of places, especially in these times. I probably would have built something from scratch. But because this is a place that is extraordinary and I want to respect the ombre of what has been passed to me and move it forward, and I, I have to be an alchemist. And I have to look um, the very hard, heavy times and um, not live in fear. I say often in our cabinet meetings, we have to live in reality, but not fear. And I know that the reality is if things move in a certain financial trend that is happening across the field, there is a world in which the workshop could not exist. And I take that very seriously. And also, if we do not audaciously invest in the way that is signature for the workshop, in artists, in radical new ways, in, you know, putting our, putting our our um, investment in the work, then we shouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so how to hold space for both of those. Um, and I'm learning. I'm learning as I go. And all I can be is, is um, myself engaging with those questions in the best kind of way I know how with the team that I have and with the coalitions that I can build. And luckily, you know, my friends, and, Friends we've known, friends we're getting to know. I also feel like I, I lean on my own audacity 
and the brilliance of the people who've been doing this for a while. I don't think we can cut these times and uh, we have to collectively try and problem solve. Yeah, um, <laughs> we often say that sentence, you know, quoting Brecht to set new times, meet new theater. Um, like that Horton here, so who do you, what do you see? Do you see new theater? What, uh, um, what, what do you feel could that be? Do you have some intuition of um, what you think in that new times, so very different than your times? You know, what, what's, what is important? What is urgent? What is meaningful? What do we need? I mean, one of the things I love about the workshop and I want to continue is that there's no single form. I'm always like, fight the monolith. There's no one way. And part of the no one way is that the new way also holds space for what was brilliant in the old way. So I always want in a season or, you know, to make space for what is virtuosic um, and, and range in that virtuosity. I myself have a very strong, probably coming from the Caribbean, coming from Carnival, I have a very strong um, idea of how do we how do we crack accessibility? And so how do we, I often say the art within the walls of the theater is the art of the art. The art of sustainability is the thing that's most challenging right now in this time that's kind of brutal and no in economics. But I'm also interested in the larger art, which is the art of belonging. So how can we get the work out to more people? How can we create that sense of community, not just within the walls, but within, I want to operate more like a library. You know, I'm interested in what is the public space. On Thursdays, we have these open streets. How can we engage more with those open streets? How can we, we are a mecca in many ways to a cross section of so many people. And we are in a society where social isolation is literally killing us and dividing us in so many ways. And so how can we make sure that the intentionality, that it's not just for the elite, because I do think that there's a way in which the art can be separated for only a small group of people and that just drives division. How can we forcefully, effectively, and intentionally make that virtuosic, risky art and invite more people to the table and bring, bring the art to where more people are and know that, that as more people have access to the art, it is, not, it is not a space of generosity. That actually makes us relevant. If we are supposed to serve a civic good, if we are supposed to be like libraries, then let us um, intentionally lean into that uh, in the lane that we are in, which is creating this productive virtuosic art. Um, question for you all. Um, I had recently a, a talk with Annie Catania, and I hope she will not mind recording her. She said, I feel we are like 1640. You know, maybe 20 years no theater, you know, or so um, of the, when she says what she looks on the scene now, also on Broadway, where that often happened to be at least a better offering, but she feels um, she's afraid. She says, you know, so many theaters closing, regional theater across the US, also here. Um, and what do you think about how, Linda, Jim, I know you go out, Jim, what do you think of the moment, this right now, in uh, in April 2023, what do you think of New York theater? Well, I see a lot of work being done by younger people who we have supported going into the institutions. Um, I think that's wonderful. I'm kind of looking for the ones who don't want the institutions, though. So I, again, you know, because this goes back to to I think what that beginning of theater, the, the origin of theater. Where are the artists if they're not downtown and they're mostly not the real, the, 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 the new generation creating work that we haven't seen before. Where are they coming from? Um, so I'm looking for the ones who don't want the salaries in the mainstream. Is there a feeling that art has, you know, that theater is art and it has a, it has a, a, a reason I don't know where they are, but that's kind of what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the ones who want to make it themselves again. And I know how difficult that is because, well, I blame real estate. I blame the real estate market, really, for a lot. But, yeah. but it, that's what's so different now than when I was young and first starting. But I, and I don't really know where they are. And there are far-flung spaces doing work. I mean, I look to the places like The Tank, uh, Jack. And Bushwood Star, you know, those are the places to me that have that. Chocolate factory. The chocolate factory, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Do they have the money? Do they have the support? You know, that's the question. You, they are there, but can they develop like a plant mixed with a lot of growth? But anyway, uh, Jim, what do you well, think? Well, what do you see right now? I don't think you can separate what is happening <clears throat> in the macro from this field, because we're just a part of that. Um, and I do feel 2020 was a major line of demarcation between the old and a new yet emerging. In all respects, global, about our species, everything. That's a new century. And <clears throat> we're, what we're experiencing in April of 2023 is the dying away of structure that functioned for how we lived as a species in the 20th century. And the 21st century structures are still tentatively finding their way. So I don't really know that we're, any of us are going to know what those are for a while. But I think it's all up for quest. It's all up for grabs. It's all um, to be discovered, to be invented. And I think there's an excitement to that. And I think Wenda's point about artists wanting to get away from the institutional structure is is correct. Um, I also remember coming to New York in the early mid seventies in that neighborhood of East Fourth Street, Lowry. How exciting that was because it was so uninstitutional. It was so um, against the grain, um, and it's now kind of grown up and gotten old, um, like me and. Um, there's a new generation that's going to do that. That's going to go through that same process. If I could just give a little shout out, I was I went to it's a young artist who I've been in conversation with for a number of years who came out of the new school, um, and he invited me to a University Settlement and Bala and Israel is is curating a group of emerging artists and it's sort of interdisciplinary. They're performers though. And I went to an evening thinking, you know, in my obligatory mode of, and I was so inspired by the work, that, and they have nothing. That is the most under-resourced developmental program in the New York theater. They get, they get a pittance, but each of the, and it was, each piece was totally different. They're all work in progress. So I would say there's something, and that reminded me of why I do theater, what, what I saw there. So just to say, it, it is out there, and there are little, little, little sprouts, but that was one place that really, really warmed, warmed me in, in that way. So let's give, let's give Baba some support, yeah. because yeah, he's, he's got taste, he's got heart, he's a poet himself. You know, and uh, yeah, so that there that is that is that's something real. That's that's something real. So if he's there, then there are others. And his and, father was in the movie theater. Oh yeah, and his mother, yeah, yeah. and his mother just passed. Pamela, Pamela. Pamela. Yeah. yeah. I think it's part of where as much as I love the main theater at New York Theater Workshop, one of the most important things to me was that our smaller theater which had been used as dressing rooms and spillover spaces and all of those kinds of things. And it really took a lot. And I knew, I could see when we would talk about, when are we gonna put the seats back in? There was, a, there was a significant amount of resistance because we knew once the seats went back in, that it would become a theater again. And that theater would be called upon to serve its purpose in a certain kind of way that was going to mean there was gonna be another level of work and all of those kinds of things. Well, there was a, a call from um, some Ukrainian teens who were refugees from the war who had put together this verbatim piece of theater, and they asked if they could have a weekend in the Fourth Street Theater, and it hadn't been transformed yet. And I said, I don't know how to stay here if we can't find a way to say yes to that, because we are in little Ukraine. We have you know, young people who've gone through the unimaginable and, and we've got to find a way to say yes. And the team rallied around and we found a way to say yes. And I thought it was just going to be at my, you know, um, music stands. And on what I'm sure is a tiny, tiny budget, but with the support of the space, there was such an incredibly moving evening of theater 
that to me is as moving and more important than something that might have a $10 million budget on Broadway. And I think part of what we've got to do is figure out how to say yes to some of those important um, moments and how not to think that scale is everything for artistry to find those entry points, to find those spaces that even on a small budget, we can say yes. And the piece ended up being unbelievable. All of, all of the young people came in, they were 12 to 17. They came in their regular outfits. They did a mix of Ukrainian and English um, translated. And by the end, they were all wearing suits that to me symbolized how they had had to grow up in this experience. And they were pushing around strollers. And at the end, they tipped over the strollers and there was a bunch of rocks and then blackout. And it, I'm sure the budget was $500, maybe whatever it was, and it was as impactful. It sticks with me the way light raises the roof, light raises the roof sticks with me. And I think we've got it, even if it's not on scale, we've got to find a way, those of us who've had some space, to find ways to say some of those yeses um, uh, and, and for audiences to show up um, to that work. Uh, because it can be as impactful and it's going to be the thing that nourishes the soil so that the things can continue to grow. Before we go to the audience question, maybe Jean, how do you look at New York theater if you go out now with your 50 years of experience? Well, um, I guess. Can you keep the mic? Yeah, that's what it's for. <laughs> <laughs> I find, um, now, you know, I, I admire everything in New York Theatre Workshop, pretty much without exception. And, but I, you know, I, I'm, I'm frightened when I go see a play and everyone in it is gray haired and, and white, you know, I mean, I, not everyone in it, everyone in the audience. And, um, and I kind of, I just, and mostly that kind of work will put me to sleep, but you know, I, I also find that I have a great um, affection for, and usually respond more to, to theater that comes from. Well, two exceptions. The two exceptions that come to mind are they're from Britain. You know, the last thing I saw was um, uh, the play Love, which was at the Armory, and the Jungle at St. Anne's, and both of them obviously part of an institution, cultivated within an institution with probably a lot of federal funding and uh, <coughs> very long rehearsal periods and everything else. And I don't know, you know, I, that kind of work to me, it, 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 it completely appeals to me because it touches on real issues and is done in an extraordinarily theatrical and fascinating way. But I get scared by it because can you know how do we do that here without having to rely on the institution? I mean, are there ways to be able to do that work, you know, in somebody's um, you know hypothetical garage that we always used to say? But um, so you know, I I I hope there's a way to scale that kind of work down so that it can be done by smaller theaters and more people and new companies and that it can grow an audience of, you know, diverse people of all ages who will find it worth investing in and, and worth following and, and calling, you know. I'll say this might sound wild, but I think a lot about universal health care. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I think, how can we have a safety net so that the level of experimentation can still happen on any budget, but without asking people to go um, to a level of, of not making enough money because there's no support network. So if they fell in the, you know, they fell, they fall off the sidewalk and then they're out of it. And so I, I just keep thinking, what are some of the some of the basic social networks that if we had individual institutions or individuals or collectives wouldn't be so hard pressed in this cruel, cruel time uh, to, to institutionalize, to have a salary, to have, you know, a lot of the things that need to happen so that we can feel like we're not going to be left out on the street. 
um, if we don't make a, a certain kind of minimum. And so I think about that a lot with the responsibilities I have. How can I, and some of the rooms, we're also in some very glamorous rooms. This is a devastating time and the top 0.1% grew their wealth in this time. We are in some of those rooms. We are in conversation with some of those people. How can we use our platforms to say, how do we make change? How do we support not just uh, our organization, but how do we support some of the, the network underneath that, safety net underneath that's gonna allow artists and all kinds of human beings to exist with more freedom, take more risks, um, and create whatever is the art of their soul um, without feeling like they're going to fail if they don't become institutionalized. Well, may I jump in? Um, <clears throat> absolutely. This is what I was saying earlier. You can't separate the journey or the unfolding of this field, these artists, from the larger picture. And it has never changed in the course of my lifetime the lack of value that our culture places on the role of the artist. It's never changed. It maybe has gotten a little better, a little worse over time in different moments, <clears throat> but that has never changed. Um, and at least in my experience, the voices of the artists are the ones that go beneath the sort of what passes for journalism, um, you know, which tends to be about um, MSNBC versus Fox, or if it's about Trump said this or Trump did that in the, in the courtroom today, rather than talking about what Patricia just mentioned, is there are basic fundamental value questions that we're not addressing, probably purposefully by some to keep us from talking about those. But but. This is where it gets so frustrating to me because I think we're only going to break through if we can hear the voices of the artists loudly and clearly and they're centered in our lives. Because I really believe they're, they are the ones who have the vision and the passion. And yet, we're denied their presence or their presence is minimized by all of the value issues. So, this is not an unfamiliar struggle and a, a formulation, um, but I think it's more intense these days in April 2023, as you say, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's open up some comments or questions. Yeah, they are all together, and who knows when they will come back together. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, first is just this is a thank you because in uh, championing championing form and the directors you also championed the extension of design and the extension of dramaturgy and so as a dramaturg sitting next to a designer just uh, and more but i just want to say thank you for that um and it was then really meaningful when i first came to new york city as a theater maker in 2000 with one year lease and we would rent space across the street at Teatro Circulo, it meant that we were in community with you and with Form and with La Mama and with Teatro Circulo. And, it's, and East Forth is so special. It's a special space. Um, and I just was wondering if, if you would just give us, and maybe the audience that's out there, just a little bit of that community. That, that's like there's East Forth is, will always be something quite special in terms of the community and the relationship to the art that is in the theater that's being made there. So I'd just love to hear a little bit about that. Well, can I jump in? I, I think, well, you have Ellen Stewart. Right. She's yeah. our mama, right. and she is the mama of this, you know, and I, I think that Mia, you, it was fully groomed in the best sense by Ellen and <laughs> carries on in Ellen's spirit. I think, I think Ellen would be very happy with what she's doing. So I think that's, First and foremost, then you, as I say, our two spaces have historic precedent. The truck and warehouse. What was the name? Um, David uh, well, of the David. of the Fourth Street Theater. Anyway, so I think you got you got that history. <laughs> <laughs> you know his name. Yeah. Um, David. David. Uh, the um, 
New Brahminists actually started in, in, in that, that had, had a, a, a early presence in that space. So, as I say, I think the Lamana space itself was a German cultural um, uh, center for immigrants. And there, there's a theater in you know the the building on East Fourth Street with the uh, with the circular stairs. That's an old Astor place, and there was a theater up on the top floor that I I know the late Robert Patrick used with his little company back again in the in the 90s. So I think there's that, and then we have formally we have the Fourth Arts Block because uh, what was it about 15 years ago now, Jim? The the city wanted artists who were renting spaces on East 4th Street to be able to buy them, and they went out of their way to figure out how to do that. And the workshop wasn't in a city space, at that, a city-owned space, but because we took a lead and we had a little more resource than some of the smaller companies, we did take a hand in uh, some seeding the planning. <coughs> and and we, we uh, earned the, the shop space, the New York Theater workshop, shop space next to La Mama in that. But the Fourth Arts Block is a coalition of all of the small theater companies and spaces on that block now. So, and it's been designated as a, a cultural district, which is rare. So I think you, you've got, you've got, again, there's, there are layers of culture and layers of history that make the block what it is. And if there is any downtown theater, that is probably still the center. And then, of course, the public theater is just, you know, is a, is a block or two away. Yeah, but anyway, I think that's, you know. And Brett Scranson had a yeah. chocolate store. Yes, right? Sebastian. 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 Yeah. Also, there is um, something that is meaningful to me. Um, right across the street from the workshop is what was the bar called Stillwater. That's now under renovation to be a restaurant, and then they are reclaiming Club 82. Club 82, I was going to say. <clears throat> right, which was a legendarily yeah. historically uh, cross dressing drag club. And the people that are doing Red Drops, and the guy I've been talking to, are very aware of the history of that community, of that street, and very much want to be honoring that and be a part of that. So I feel like that is the kind of energy that's very healthy mm -hmm. and exciting, which is to, to be understanding where you come from and figuring out how you take that and make it new. And the KGB bar, the poetry. Yes, 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 let's give it to uh, Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. It was, uh, it's pretty inspiring. I have one practical question. It, because you're speaking of history, where do you keep uh, all your archives? material. So over the pandemic, one of the things that happened was a great archive project. And so all kinds of things that have been hidden in, you know, desk drawers and in the basement and in a storage space were all pulled out and put uh, primarily, I think, in the rehearsal studio upstairs. And they, we have two archivists. Um, there was funding from the archive project. And now we have in these gray, very organized with a with a digital archive that you can cross reference so you can say Michael Garces and all of a sudden all the pieces that he has you know been involved in it will tell you box 47 and then you can go to box 47 you can pull the thing out you can pull out the original Jonathan Larson letter pitching you know what would become rent you can pull all of these things out and so I think it's a great question there has been for a long period of time and I think one of the things that's wonderful um, about going into the workshop is you feel the history of ghosts that were predated New York Theatre Workshop you feel the his the ghosts of New York Theatre Workshop and now it's organized in the last couple of years in this way and uh, I think we're figuring out how can that be a resource as often as possible to as many communities as possible and that, that was that predated me, but it very much appealed to my desire for this to function like a library, to, to have all of this history that has been documented available in a variety of ways. And some of that will mean coming to East Fourth Street, which I think is a magical, very, very special place. And the embodied experience of being in that space is, is irreplaceable. And then I want it also to be accessible um, for people who might be international or national or, or uptown and just not have an ability to get to uh, East Fourth Street in a certain way. So I'm very excited that the, uh, the uh, uh, archive is really there 
um, and available in a variety of ways for people. Yeah, one more question, comment. Oh, excuse me. Uh, I know Stella had the one said when you're in a period where the theater has nothing to say, the sets get bigger. Um, <laughs> so I think what we're talking about, which is um, you don't have to have these elaborate sets. Um, then you get to the essence of theater. But it does beg the question. I, I know that uh, a friend of mine and I were looking at spaces, theater spaces, possibly to rent. And there was one space, and we said, um, uh, well, what's going on here? It's empty. And they said, oh, well, we're doing a show. Uh, it, it, it opens, it goes into rehearsal, or opens at the end of the week. And we said, well, what are you doing with it now? And they said, well, nothing. And we have a show coming in. I said, well, couldn't you get people coming in doing a stage reading or a reading, something that doesn't interrupt the set? And I'm not um, advocating the idea of, you know, putting on theater 24 seven and using the space like that. But is, is it possible to have theaters functioning or doing more theater or inviting more theater in during their downtime when, when, when that's possible? Yeah, I think, I, I think we're all figuring out how to be the best resource. And one of the resources that we have, even in an economically constrained time is space. And one of the, um, Biggest challenges is um, who makes sure the lights are turned on and that the cookie doesn't get left so that then the mouse comes. And, you know, all, what is the surround? That's why I often think that the um, art of sustainability is what I name some of that operational, some of that just like functional, in order to make that yes a yes without burning things down, we've got to have a certain amount of staff support, we've got to have a certain, so it's one of the, as a person who always wants to find the yes, as a person who's, you know, I am as a person who's very aware that we have space, and our space is not just space, it's a space that comes with a lot of um, respect that when you walk into the space, people, you know, you see people's shoulders kind of go up and, and as much as in some ways it's a challenge that it's become institutionalized, it can also be a real value, especially for emerging or all kinds of artists that people say, oh, I'm here. I know that doing a reading at New York Theater Workshop gives something to some, somebody. So even if all we can do is turn on the lights and give some music stands, I want to be able to offer that asset. And I also have to raise funds and do a lot of things to make sure that the lights can be turned on and the cookie can be swept up so that then the room is there for the next day and the next generation. Yeah, and uh, I think the, the one of the theaters that really opened the doors, the shed, if I wish it right, was empty for three months on those spaces, you know. Yeah. They're just a $500 million project. Just in the we don't have money or we yeah. find a way to use it. It's not about these, it's not about but one or two more questions. Um, if not, you know, really, um, I think we all are very fast to criticize. We are very fast to say what's wrong, what's missing, what hasn't been done. And we don't say thank you enough or show our gratitude. And I think this is also really a moment to um, say something to two great workers in the vineyard of theater, in global theater, American theater, but especially, of course, New York and theater. And it's very rare um, that people are so long put their life in, and that's what Jim said. Oh, you know, they put their life's energy there, like flowers that bloom. You know, you see that mm -hmm. the beautiful colors. We want we are all organic beings, and we want to shine and um, be alive in the sense of theorists. And they were alive, and they did an incredible work over the time. It's a great commitment. Everybody who works in theater knows how hard that is, especially in New York and in American theater. So um, a lot of respect, I think, you know, to what you guys did, what you created, and what you gave as a gift. And theater always and art is a gift for the next generation. So um, we really want to say thank you also for this. And
<laughs> and you all get a chance to haul around uh, Tia and DJ for having us and the viewers and everybody in the room. Thank you. And big love to Patricia McGregor. <laughs> and Frank, thank you for caring about the theater in the biggest possible way because nobody, nobody knows what you do.